Welcome back to the weekly question show. Your questions, my answers. Remember, wherever you are on my channel, ask a question, I will answer it here. All right, let's get started. First couple of questions are gonna come from our patrons. Alan Pomeroy, we're finding out a lot about the physiological problems associated with prolonged exposure of humans to zero gravity. In the Mars movie in 2001, they solved the zero gravity issue with large revolving habitats to create artificial gravity. How big would such an artificial gravity structure have to be and how difficult expensive to assemble in space? Right, to get some kind of artificial gravity, you're gonna need this rotating space station. And the size of which, I mean, none have ever been built, but the size is on the order of tens of meters. The problem is, is that if it's too small, you get this weird effect where your feet are moving at a different speed from your head and it causes nausea. So you want a station that's got a big enough size and you're gonna need, say, uh, tens of meters to 100 meters to really get something that feels comfortable. And so there's been a few ideas. You could have like an actual ring, but you could also have like just something with a counterbalance. So on one side you've got the crew compartment and on the other side you've got say the reactor and the two just go around and around and that provides that counterbalance. There are plans right now, there's a thing called the Nautilus X, which could put an actual rotating part onto the International Space Station, and then that could test these ideas. That could astronauts, say, sleep in, in full gravity? And in my opinion, I think this is the next most important step that we need to take with being able to live long duration spaceflight. We need to solve the microgravity problem, and that's gonna be some kind of rotating artificial gravity space station. And in the future, they're gonna be these great big O'Neill cylinders with hundreds of thousands of people living in them, and they wouldn't even know that they weren't living on, uh, on Earth. Larry Beckham, I wonder if baryonic matter is a component of dark matter. If you have a cluster of billions of small, cold, dark objects, like rocks or even crystals of frozen gases, could you detect it at the distance of the galactic halo? Could you have a cluster of unseen rocks the size of many parsecs that explain the gravitational effect? Is anyone looking to the possibility that dark matter is a mix of baryonic and non-baryonic matter? Yes, absolutely. Astronomers have definitely wondered, is the missing mass, the dark matter, actually just regular stuff that's just so far away that we can't see it? Maybe it's black holes. Uh, but there are the kinds of observations that you would detect that would tell you if that stuff was actually stuff. It would interact in ways that dark matter just doesn't seem to interact. You would see it as galaxies collided. You would see this matter coming together, heating up, releasing radiation, and astronomers don't see that. The dark matter just passes right through each other and forms these gigantic clouds. Now, that said, there is some amount of matter, of regular baryonic matter that does appear to be missing, and it's probably that. It's probably gas, dust, rocks, material that just hasn't been added up that sort of adds to the survey. So it's like, there's the matter that we know what it is, there's the stuff that we know is matter, but we don't know what it is, but we know that it's out there, and then there's dark matter, which we don't even know what it is. Mark, is there an RSS feed specifically for the audio? Not that I mind the videos, just I listen while working and don't need the video. The old RSS link that I had was for video and isn't updating. So just for Mark and everyone else to know, that we actually release the audio and the video of the Guide to Space and the Question Show, maybe, as uh, an audio and video podcast. So. If you like to watch stuff on YouTube, you can do that. If you like to get your stuff via uh, a podcast, you can do that as well. They're on you. We'll put the link here so you can see them. I think it's yours today slash feed slash audio and then slash feed slash video. But uh, go to those, put them into your podcasting app, and then you'll get the newest episodes in either audio or video right onto your mobile device. Reasonable comment. What do you expect once we reach the technological singularity in the next 30 to 40 years? Uh, for anyone who doesn't know, the idea of the technological singularity is that our technology is advancing so quickly that at some point in the near or far future, technology will increase at a exponential rate and we will, we kind of don't know what happens after that. If you get faster and faster technology, who knows what's gonna happen? Now, is the technological singularity gonna happen or not? I don't know. A lot of people think that it is. A lot of people think that that's crazy. My instinct, my hunch, my guess, 
as a person who likes to think about the future, is that, that there will be, once we give computers the ability to make computers better, it is going to create a sort of runaway uh, increase in technology, and we'll have a really hard time really knowing what looks what it looks like on the other side of that. Will the computers take over? Will they turn the entire planet Earth into computronium and then colonize the entire Hubble sphere of the universe? And it's just computers in all directions and they don't need us anymore, maybe. Will we merge with our computers and form some kind of robot hybrid humanity that then explores the universe? Maybe, although I don't think so. I mean, really, why do the computers need to keep us around except because they're feeling nostalgic, like they like humans, like we make great pets. Will we master the computers and keep them under control and fly around the universe with our meat bodies, even though we're soft and fragile and prone to radiation and dying? That doesn't sound like a great idea. So I think if I think of all those possible options, I kind of think that the robots are going to take over. And is it going to happen in 30, 40 years? Maybe, or maybe 100? I think it's going to happen. So what will we do to hope they like us as pets? Ethan Roberts. Would it be theoretically possible to accelerate a spacecraft to say one-tenth the speed of light by slingshots around the planets in our solar system, or is it only possible for a black hole to do? How would doing this affect the solar system as so much energy would have been used? We did a whole episode about gravitational slingshots, and here's the short version of this, right? Is that you take a spaceship and you get close to a large planet, like say Jupiter. As you fall towards Jupiter, you are falling in and out of Jupiter's gravity well, and, and that cancels out. You fall in, you fall out, you, get, you gain speed, you lose speed, it's the same thing. But the whole point is that Jupiter is going around the sun, and it has an orbital momentum, and as your spaceship falls into Jupiter's gravity, Jupiter pulls your spaceship up to its orbital speed going around the sun. Now you steal a little bit of Jupiter's momentum. So you actually lower its, its orbit around the sun and you get a speed boost. In theory, you could keep doing this, gain more and more speed boost, go faster and faster and faster. I don't, you couldn't go with the speed of light, although theoretically you could gather an almost unlimited amount of, of energy from the planets, but the problem is, is that as you got closer and closer to Jupiter, you would have to skim through the cloud tops, and so there's kind of a maximum speed. The other problem is just the physics involved of going close to those planets and, and really getting cranked around by their gravity as you do this gravitational slingshot. And to take it to that, con that extreme constant, you've got that black hole, you come in for a gravitational slingshot of a black hole that's maybe orbiting the center of the Milky Way, and you're going to get cranked in this really tight radius, and what kind of spaceship could go from zero to a significant portion of the speed of light in that, in that one slingshot? So, so the gravitational slingshots are really going to be used by us to increase our speed within the solar system, but not necessarily to go to the kinds of speeds that would get you from star to star. Rubik Fan 1, if NASA offered you a three month journey to the ISS, would you take it? Uh, yeah, if I could get, oh, three months, that's a long time. Uh, like two weeks, that would be cool. I would do that. Three months, sure. If you could promise to me that it was safe and I would have some interesting science to do, I, I, would, I would do a three month journey to the ISS. Longer than that, probably not. Like Earth is great. Space is scary and dangerous. And I really appreciate the sacrifices made by the astronauts to go and help us explore and understand space. Um, but but I, I, I would go there for a vacation or to check it out or like go to the surface of Mars briefly, but I still want to come back to Earth. Earth is excellent. Buzzin' Ozdammer. Why don't you do an episode at the beach instead of trees in the background? I don't know, something different. That is a great question. Let me explain. We shoot here in the forest um, because the light is generally fairly even and blocked, let's see, by, can you get there? Blocked by, so I'm, there's a tree there that's blocking the sunlight on me. So 
So we try to maintain the amount of light that we have. The other part is that if you have like the beach, you've got this really bright area behind you and it's really hard to kind of illuminate me compared to the beach. Being blinded here again. The other problem is that when you're at the beach, there's a lot of wind. So the wind blows in and hits the microphone. And, oh, this is fun. Um, so that's a problem. I lost my windsock on the microphone. Anyway, um, and then the other thing is when you're at the beach, people walk by and they're like, what are you doing? And you're like, we're shooting a video about space. They're like, I love space. And you're like, I know, me too, but we're doing a video right now and they wanna talk about space. So, so we need places and we don't shoot inside because uh, it's actually harder to light inside. You've seen some videos that I've done where I shoot, we shoot inside and they kind of suck. Maybe because we're not great at it because <laughs> we've spent so much time out in the forest. But, but the thing is that just, you know, we like the outside light. It's more even to get to. It's quicker and easier for us to set up out here. And it's kind of pretty, right? So uh, we've, if you kind of go back, we, ha we have shot at the beach. We've actually shot up in the mountains one time. Sometimes we shoot inside. Sometimes we shoot in my backyard. But this is like, maybe we're like just super lazy at this point. This is like the place that we can shoot, that we know how to do, and everything is dependable and it allows us to make these videos without really being frustrated by all of the difficulties of shooting. So that's why we do it. User WL2850, question Fraser, what's your thoughts on China getting to Mars first? Maybe teaming up with Russia? How advanced is China's space program? China's space program is not as advanced as the United States program or the Russian space program. Both have had tremendous experience in sending humans to space. That said, China is single-mindedly moving towards their human space exploration program. So while it looks like the American program is kind of like, we're going to do the Orion, and then we're going to do the Constellation, and we're going to change our mind, and we're going to go see an asteroid, then we're going to go to the Mars or back to the moon. China is, we're doing this, then we're doing that, then we're doing this, then we're doing that. And we don't even know what their plans are, but they sent up an astronaut, they sent up multiple astronauts, they sent up a space station, they put people on the space station, they've put a rover on the moon, they've sent a mission past the moon. Their plans are probably to send humans to the moon. And so will they be the next people to, to set foot on the moon? I wouldn't be surprised if the next people to walk on the moon are the Chinese. Will the Russians help them? Probably not. Uh, the Russians provided a lot of their technology for the Chinese to make their initial capsules and a lot of the way the rockets work, but uh, the Russians have their own plans for, for how they're planning to send people further and further into space. So uh, yeah, I, I wouldn't be surprised. Glockfan1990, what would happen if a human came in contact with dark matter? Sorry for the stupid question. Not a stupid question. <laughs> it's a great question. Watch out, dark matter, it's everywhere. Probably nothing. In fact, you could be having dark matter streaming through your body right now. A good example of something that's like this is neutrinos, right? There are neutrinos streaming from the sun in vast quantities, and they are all passing right through your body right now, and they have no impact whatsoever. In fact, you could fire a neutrino through a light year of solid lead, and it would probably make its way through it. So dark matter, you know, astronomers say that dark matter has a very low cross section, right? So it's like, how big is the particle of dark matter? And the thinking is that the particle is incredibly small, like neutrino small or smaller. And so dark matter would just pass through your body and you wouldn't even experience it. And you could very well have it going through your body right now. Or maybe it's clumped up in other places. But the point is, is that from what we can tell, it doesn't interact in any way, shape or form with regular matter. Nico's mind, what do you think of the ISS? I've heard scientists call it international pork. And Freeman Dyson was hired by the Board of Scientists to look into ISS and the experiments on it. Out of the 46 projects, they deemed 44 to be better done on Earth or off the ISS, too much noise. The only experiments they deemed the ISS was needed for was two humans in space experiments. I have mixed feelings about the International Space Station. On the one hand, it is the most complicated vehicle thing that humanity has ever built. And so to build the most complex machine is a tremendous accomplishment. And to put this thing in space, that is like just doing it is worthy of doing it, right? Uh, and at the same time, it is just a perfect example of international collaboration. The Russians, the Americans, uh, us, the Canadians, the British have, you know, many, many, many other countries, the Brazilians, like so many other countries have helped build 
parts for the International Space Station and astronauts from different countries in the world have staffed on board. So that feels like, like the Federation from Star Trek, like countries coming together, building this thing, being up there in space. Now, is it the most efficient thing that could be built in space? Well, the, no, probably not, but then sometimes you just kind of never know what's the most efficient thing until you build a thing and then realize that that wasn't the most efficient thing. So. There are experiments that have been done that could be done. There's more experiments going up all the time to the station. Some of them are a good idea, some of them are a bad idea, but I'm really glad that they're being done. Could money be used more effectively than the International Space Station? Maybe, um, but chances are that other thing would run into cost overruns and would have, would, people would realize that it was, wasn't as good of an idea as they thought at the time and needed to tweak it. Like, like that's, that's discovery, that's advancement, that's curiosity, that's pushing your capabilities further than they are today. I think there are a lot of really complicated unsolved questions in space exploration that, that it's time to go to next, right? We know that humans can go around and around the Earth. Can they go around and around the Earth further? Can we figure out a way to deal with the, the radiation in space? Can we create artificial gravity in some kind of rotating cylinder? Like these are the next steps. And so I'm really a fan of, of just taking what's been done so far and just pushing it more and more into the future. So if we never go any further than the International Space Station, then I'd be super disappointed. But I see it as a stepping stone into what we're doing next and a tremendous accomplishment for humankind. So I. I I'm not, I don't know, I don't see why people are so down on the space station, right? Like it cost a lot of money, but not as much as war. Black hole. Could there be a chain of L4, L5 points? Like a planet is at zero degrees, planet B is in planet A's L4 point, planet C is at planet B's L4 point, etc. Right, the idea of Lagrange points is that there are these places where the gravity forces balance out. So you could have, say, the Sun and the Earth, and in between them there's all, there's all the different Lagrange points. And the L4 and the L5 points are the ones that go before and after in uh, sort of on a planet's orbit, and they are stable, which means that if you put something in, the, in that place, it will tend to return back to that place with no additional energy. The deal with the Lagrange points, though, is that you need to have two objects of mass and then the Lagrange points, you can have a thing that is essentially of zero mass or close to zero mass. In other words, a tiny asteroid or a satellite. It has to be negligible mass compared to the objects that are creating the Lagrange points. So a space station or an asteroid, that's fine. A whole planet, then it can't act like a Lagrange point anymore. Now, could you set up a bunch of stable, a stable orbits where they're all in sort of perfect position from each other, orbiting around a sun? Maybe, but chances are they're going to start to slightly drift around and clump up and mash into each other and explode and everybody dies. So, so that would be the kind of the reality. I guess theoretically you could keep things in, in place from each other. Puya Rastin. Hey Fraser, I got a question. If we go in any direction in space and go for billions of years with a speed near that of light, will we eventually get back to where we started? It all depends on whether the universe is infinite or finite. If the universe is infinite, if it goes on forever, then the answer is no. You go in any one direction, you just keep going forever and ever and ever and ever for infinity, and you never return. If the universe is finite, then the answer is maybe. That if you go in any one direction on Earth, for example, you return to your starting point. And if the universe is finite, then in any one direction you go, you would return to your starting point. And so it's kind of crazy, right? You, you know, if you look in that direction, you could see the back of your head from that direction. But we don't know whether the universe is finite or infinite, but that's one of the implications of a finite universe. Well, thanks everyone for your questions. That was awesome. As always, I had a lot of fun. Uh, once again, if you are watching these videos anywhere, go ahead, put in a question on any one of my videos and I will find a bunch of them and answer them here. Uh, as I did last time, I put together a playlist of cool space astronomy science videos that I've been watching in the last little while so you can kind of see what I'm watching and that starts right here. Thanks for everyone. Mm.